to invite on stage uh, George Kurtz, founder and CEO of CrowdStrike. All right. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to have you. It's great to be here. So I want to start with a caveat. Yep. I know nothing about cybersecurity. I don't know technology. <laughs> uh, I don't believe her. No. <laughs> Can't even hack into my kid's phone, I got to say, even though I tried. Um, but we want to talk about leadership. We want to talk about business and that I know. But I want to ask you first to think of your uh, questions that I can't ask because I don't know what to ask. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask them at the end. And also if I'm asking him something and his answer like, requires like, an obvious follow-up, which is technical and I'm missing, feel free to uh, help me. Okay? <laughs> that's, so that's our deal. Um, but I actually want to start with uh, asking you about car racing. All right. So yesterday, easy topic. Easy topic. So yesterday, uh, yesterday I went to a dinner. We do a series of dinner and dialogue with investors. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jacques and Elik that uh, uh, introduced it and kind of managed the conversation said, okay, I want everyone to share what they're passionate about that has nothing to do uh, with your professional life or with your, with your family. And um, everybody, pe people were passionate about tennis, about jigsaw puzzles, about yoga, about uh, martial arts, me. Uh, but you obviously have a big passion for uh, car racing, so tell us about it. Yeah, so uh, I wish I was able to start a little bit younger. I needed to, to, to sell my first company to get involved in it. But I was always uh, kind of a gearhead and uh, just, you know, raced all kinds of junk that I had when I was a kid. And got into uh, to racing uh, probably in 2007, something like that. Uh, actually, one of our board members at McAfee. Uh, and then uh, got better and kept going and kept going up the ranks until until uh, and to where I am now in, in uh, two pro series. But um, why do I like it? I think it's one of those sports where there there is no hiding. Like it's how did you do? Either your first, second, or last, or whatever. And you look at the clock. And you, the clock doesn't lie. So when we think about uh, business, there is a tie-in, which is you know speed and execution matters, and it's a team sport because you can't just be the best driver and win without the, the team. So the thing I like about it is there, there's no hiding. You are, it is what it is, and uh, it's very competitive. And I'm, I'm a pretty competitive guy. Actually, it reminds me we had Owen Kaspi, who's an Israeli that was on the NBA. He came to give a talk, and his entire talk was about, about similarities between being a competitive athlete in a team and things in business. Uh, well, I, I ask this all the time uh, of people that I talk to or interview, I, and, I, and you can think about the question, what drives you more? Is it your love to win or your hatred to lose? And um, <clears throat> I ask this to a, a uh, I'll digress for one minute, I ask this to a reserve Formula One driver. Um, you know, we're involved in the, uh, in the, with the Mercedes team. So we were having dinner one night, and I said, hey, what, he was a reserve driver. And I said, what drives you to, 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 is it will to win or hatred to lose? He said, I love to win. And I said, okay, let me ask you, how long does it take, like, how long does the winning last? And he said, well, you know, like that weekend. And I go, when you lose, how long does it last? He goes, oh, to the next race. I can't, I'm, I'm you know, eating myself up to the next race. I said, see, you, you hate to lose. And I, I yelled over to Toto, I said, Toto, do you like to win or, or you hate to lose? You go, oh, I hate to lose. I hate to lose, right? So I think it's that level of uh, sort of drive that you know, I found in entrepreneurs, uh, and by the way, in salespeople as well, that really kind of gets you over the edge of, uh, of being great. So speaking about entrepreneurship, um, you, had, you were an entrepreneur of two startups. Yep. Uh, both of them did well. As someone pointed out before, that's almost 100% success. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and uh, I want to ask you about your perspective now as the founder CEO. What is, um, you know, we have many CEOs here that will grow with their companies. Yeah. Um, is it the best thing for a company where the founder remains the CEO? Is there a time when you want to change and have a professional CEO? Well, it is a good question. And in fact, um, before we did our IPO, we actually did a study of the most successful companies by equity value, and those are the ones that actually had this, the founder CEO still in place. So I actually think it's important in today's environment, you know, if, if you have the right skill set and, and personality, um, I think the, the founder CEO who can scale with the company is, is best because it's your baby, right? And you know, you know, all the good, the bad, the ugly, where the bodies are buried, but I think, Having someone come in from the outside, if it's needed or, you know, it's okay, but I don't think anyone takes as good a care of, of the company as the person who actually started it. But I'm sure, like, the needs change, of course, over time. What do you enjoy the most about your job now versus what you enjoyed the most in the beginning? 
Uh, well, in the beginning, it was, you know, get in front of a whiteboard, and uh, I always um, like to say we'd had Bob Ross moments, and I, I don't know if, if that... Uh, if that makes sense to everybody in the audience, but Bob Ross, you know Bob Ross, you know. Okay, so Bob Ross, in the U.S. was um, he was this artist, and he would be on a public television, and and he'd have a half hour, and he would take a blank canvas, and in a half hour he'd paint like this emo most amazing picture. It was just blank every time he started. It was blank. So, we had this this saying at CrowdStrike, you know, did you have to Bob Ross it because we were just making stuff up, and he, everything was a blank canvas, right? So. Um, I think that was really, you know, exciting. Like there was no term EDR. There was no what we built. There was nothing out there. So we were just making it up. How do you sell it? We were making it up. So I miss kind of that piece of it. I, I don't mean making it up. Like we just had to create things. Um, what I like best about my job now, probably still meeting with customers. I really enjoy going out and and talking to them and and going through the process and solving problems and learning from them. So let's talk a bit about CrowdStrike. Yeah. From zero to two billion in ten years. I'm sure all the entrepreneurs do want to copy this. Uh, what's the secret sauce? What are like three things that you do extremely well and brought you to that? Three things. Um, I, I think first was um, taking, taking the long-term approach to building CrowdStrike. And um, what I mean by that is when we started the company, we really focused on building the platform out to get, a, to get our agent out and data into the uh, cloud and then do the AI and then do prevention last. We actually did that last. Um, but it was really, you know, there's a lot of competitors who shortcutted their way into just an, a better AV product, and they're all out of business. And I would go into a meeting and, and sort of ask, well, why are we putting gold-plated plumbing in this thing? Like, you know, we got to get this thing out. And, and the engineer, we had a great team. And they said, look, like, you're, you're going to thank us later. And this is how we were able to scale and how we were able to create all these modules and monetize it. So I think taking a long-term approach is important. Focus, our original focus was, um, you know, finding a problem in the market which existed, which is, I never met anyone who hugged me and said, I love my AV product. They're like, you know, I was, I begrudgingly. Go to Burning Man. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> Uh, I begrudgingly took over the CTO role at McAfee, and I was like, oh my God, what did I get myself into? So we found a product uh, market fit. People hated their AV product, and we were there. And then um, I would say the third, and, and maybe I'm not sure these are in any particular order, but the third one was you know, really focused on the first uh, 20 people and, and people in general to build our technology. We had a launch team, and uh, we call them launch employees. They weren't founders, but um, they were kind of. And wherever they wanted to live, they lived, and we handpicked the first 20 people, which built the foundation to what, to what we have today. But do you mean uh, build a foundation in terms of um, technical abilities or in terms of culture? It, both, because you, you, you have to set the stage early in the culture of, hey, we're going to get it done, we're going to be innovative, we're going to take hard problems and solve them. I, I give an example. We, had a, we hired a bunch of Microsoft early engineers that did our kernel work um, when I first started the company, and I said... I was in a design meeting and I said, hey, we have to build an agent, but it can't, it can't reboot when you install it. And these are all Microsoft NT351 kernel engineers. They're all curmudgeons. And they're like, no, no, you can't do that. You know, you install Adobe and it reboots. And I said, Half, you have to do it. And um, this is one of the areas, maybe it's the fourth pillar of success, was how easy it was to install the product and get it to immediate time to value. But the six months we actually took to get it to work has paid dividend. We literally took six months and a couple of patents on making it work because right now, this is a big one for customers, when you install our product, it literally just works. And you don't have to go into an organization and reboot 100,000, 300,000 machines. And I think that definitely is a takeaway for the people in the audience. Like, If you want to get into an enterprise, you, you, can't, it, you can't disrupt what they're doing and you have to have immediate time to value. That's great. Did, you, did everybody write that down? The four pills of success, okay. But I think, um, well, this big success probably has a downside as well, very minor. It's like, how do you keep on growing? If you were named fastest growing endpoint security, so how do you top that? How do you become even faster growing than yourself? How do you stay innovative? Well, and another, another good question, yeah. So when you look at the growth, um, there, there was a couple of stats, and then I'll answer your question, which I didn't, I didn't really understand until I got into the process. So when we IPO'd, all the bankers came back and they did all their work and they said, you're the fastest growing software, at scale software company to ever IPO. And I'm like, you know, 
VMware and all these other things. And like, well, they never IPO'd at, until later and all this stuff. So I had no idea that we were in that rare era. And we were the second fastest to get to two billion in ARR just behind Zoom. So when you think about the success, everyone's like, okay, well, what's next? And I think for me, it's, um, again, really thinking about the long term. What's the next act? You know, you have one act and then the second and the third act. And really what I try to do is to build something for the future and, and it focus on the platform piece of it. And how do we extend the platform into doing more for customers and continue to consolidate the spend uh, at, in those accounts? Uh, we got into things like identity, um, data protection, um, cloud workload protection. There's a whole bunch of areas, but I try to keep them all related to what we do in our space and they're not too far afield. Like you won't see us in network because we're not network people. We're endpoint workload data, you know, security folks. And I think that level of focus has been helpful and we'll just continue to try to extend that out. But, um, you know, growing 60% at a $2 billion, you know, annual recurring revenue run rate is, uh, you know, forever is not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do. So you're actually growing horizontally in a way. You're trying to reach more subcategories. Exactly. So we, we, I think our TAM was like 10 billion ish when we IPO'd the company. It's like 106 now because we keep adding more adjacencies. And we started with one module. We've got 22 modules today. So that's really, it really is a page out of the Salesforce playbook. As what I are saying. the next modules you want to add? Can I ask? Uh, you can ask and we'll tell you. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> tell me, tell me quietly. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's just uh, listening. It's not to, network. You, oh, you just said it's not cloud. It's not network. Yeah. No, it's not network. So I think it's just, again, extending out um, some of the areas that, uh, that we focus on, which is endpoint and workload, identity and data. And there's always more things to do in those areas. And how do you stay innovative? I mean, many people don't want to work for a big corporate uh, versus a startup. It's not lean. It's not quick enough. Um, it's, it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, speaking from my own experience, it was very frustrating. Yeah. But... Um, how do you keep an innovative spirit uh, and the spirit of a startup when you become a corporate? How many employees now? Uh, 6,000 plus. Yeah, so it, it's one of those areas where we, we, try to, we try to keep innovation in our DNA. And, and it is hard, you know, when you're 6,000 plus people because a lot of folks, um, you know, weren't there from the beginning, don't know the story. That we hired half of our people during COVID in a remote, et cetera. And what we used to do is we used to, Every employee, no matter where they were in the globe, no matter what level they were at, um, they all flew into uh, California and, and went through a one-week immersive orientation. Just during to keep COVID? Not during, before COVID. Okay. You know, and then after that, we had to go to more remote. But what, where I'm going with that is that was a big part of like, hey, we're, this is the way we think about things just differently than, than others, and, and innovation is a big part of it. So we try to keep that spirit alive of innovation. And one of the things that we do uh, it used to be called Think Week, it's now called Accelerate, but we actually um, break the teams out and um, they kind of get together, they form their own teams and they spend a better part of a week. They get to take whatever week they want and then we have a contest. So we, they come up with the problems and generally the problems are known, like hard things that we want to solve. And then they prototype it, they kind of put it together and prototype it and then we actually um, have a, a contest, video contest where they make the videos, then we vote on it, and then the winners um, actually get additional stock awards that come out of it. So, wow, so a big monetary. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a it's a big uh, it's a prestigious thing to win, you know, in, in CrowdStrike. So small things like I don't know that they're small, but we try to keep the the innovative spirit alive. So that's the innovative spirit, but there's also um, just. Um, Staying on top of new technologies, mm -hmm. um, speaking with startups, I guess, and yeah, and learning. Yeah, it's it's tough because you have to, you know, when you get to six thousand people, you don't want to have the incumbent mindset. You want to have the insurgent mindset, okay. right? And it's hard to to continue to keep that because you're just hiring so many people, right? So I think it's really important for people to to stay hungry and just always want to figure out how we disrupt the market. Do you think CrowdStrike is in the insurgent uh, mindset? Well, we're trying to be a scaled insurgent, yeah. And I think, you know, from what, we, what we're doing and the teams we have, I mean, we're still, we still set the bar in terms of what we come out with. And we have a lot of competitors that copy us. But if you look at the innovation, we're still driving a lot of innovation. And um, I think, you know, with, with the people we have and, and uh, you know, my view of the world, I think we'll continue to do that. Is there any um, mistake that you think you've made early on that could have impacted? I mean, obviously you succeeded, so maybe yeah. there's none. But well, it's the number one state mistake that most people will, will make in this room, and that, that is I hired, I'm gathering probably 90% of you will make this mistake. Um, I hired the wrong salesperson as the first salesperson. 
And uh, does that sound familiar? Anybody here? <laughs> Never happened before? Um, so if you look at, at if you want to just break down sales people, there are really three areas. You have your evangelist, you have your scalers, and you have your coin-operated salespeople. And where you can run into a problem is if you take a coin-operated salesperson, which I did, uh, Oracle and sort of at scale McAfee, and brought him into an evangelical sales position, right? So you have to think about it. evangelical, you have nothing, scalar, you kind of have some stuff that works, and coin-operated is like your Oracle. Um, so what happened there was I brought this person on board and, you know, they got on board and they said, okay, you know, all right, let's get the demo. We got to roll this out. We got to show the, you know, everybody the product. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? What product? They're like, the product. I'm like, no, no, that was just the PowerPoint I showed you. There's no product yet, you know? <laughs> so it went downhill after that. Um, so that was one of the biggest mistakes that I made. So I think it's critical that you, you hire the right salesperson for the right stage of the company. That's it? Just one mistake? You asked for one. Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean. I want them to come out. Okay. I, people tell me when you have a keynote, you know, when you have yeah. to talk, you should be useful or controversial. So okay. let's be either. You know? uh, let, let, let's see what else. Uh, I have plenty of mistakes. Um, uh, my CFO is in the audience here. He is. He's got plenty of mistakes. I, I have, I have, an, I have, I have. <laughs> I have another one, uh, and I've, uh, over the years, I, I, I've actually gotten extremely efficient at this, but, um, you know, if you know somebody's not going to work out, you got to cut bait early, and I think that's another mistake that a lot of people made. I mean, I certainly have probably, you know, loyalty to a fault, but as you, as you go through the stages of um, scaling the company, the people who got you to where you are, not going to be the people that get you there. So whoever got you here is not going to get you there for the most part. And I think you just have to, um, you know, understand and recognize that. And I've come up with, I think, a fairly efficient way of trying to figure that out, which is rehiring everyone in my head uh, about every day. So my general rule of thumb is, if I, knowing what I know about a particular person today, would I, would I hire them? If the answer is no, you know, they're, they're probably, uh, I'm going to probably wish them well in their next adventure. And um, you have to have that level of focus if you really want to kind of get to the next level because, again, you can hire some great people in the beginning, but they may not be the right people for a public company of 6,000 people. I think for many of the first-time CEOs, entrepreneurs, it's also like they feel bad about letting someone go. My take is that you want to work right where you are the best fit for the job. And maybe you're not the best fit for me anymore, but you're going to be a great fit for someone else, and I'm just giving you an opportunity to find that. So it's a hard leap. It, it, it's a hard leap, and, you know, it's one of those, uh, whenever you let somebody go, like, if you're looking forward to it, that's, it's never a good sign, right? So you should have some knots in your stomach, right? Because it's just, it's not easy because, you know, you had a person who you hired. Maybe they were good when you hired them. Maybe they were the right fit. Maybe they had family situation that changed things for them. You know, there's a hundred things. And um, I think what's important is to, to have them leave. And, you know, I'm still friends with a lot of people that I had to help, you know, find other things to do. And, but I, they, they found the right home and they were the great fit for that company at that point in time. Speaking of letting people go, um, there was a talk, I don't know if it's true or not, there's an economic downturn mm -hmm. coming or here. Um, do you hear anything from that from your customers? Any expectation that the cyber market is going to go through some changes because of that? I think the cyber market is, is pretty resilient. Um, and when we think about the, the, the winds behind cyber, breaches are not going to stop in a downturn. In fact, they probably go up. They keep going up. Um, there is a lot of compliance and regulation. You look at some of the new SEC proposals in terms of notification. You look at CISA and their notification uh, requirements. So that's not going to go away. So really what it turns out to, and I, I was listening to some of the, the panels earlier, is you know, how do you consolidate some of the spend? How do you do more with less? How do you make, make it more efficient for customers so they don't have to add a whole bunch of heads? I mean, if you can do that, you are going to be successful in an upturn, downturn, sideways. Uh, you have to add value, and I think that's really important. Is like you need to think about what value you're adding to every customer every day, um, and if you can articulate that value and make a compelling, um, a compelling outcome plus a, con a compelling financial um, return, you know, say return ROI, TCO, however you want to look at it, I think you'll be successful. So I think 
it's not immune, but there is some level of uh, resiliency to it. And what we talked about um, at an earnings call last week was just, you know, we saw more approvals in the last quarter. So if, as you're getting bigger deals, as you're consolidating, you know, it just kind of goes up higher in the chain, maybe to the CFO to sign off on things. Um, and then, you know, what happens with the macro past that? I mean, I don't think anybody knows, but I do think cyber will continue to be resilient. Speaking of uh, consolidation, uh, I see many Israeli startups in cybersecurity and many that actually do the same. Do you think the future um, is consolidating? Everybody will be eventually acquired by someone and there will be big companies that offer everything? Or is there room for the small <coughs> startups? Well, in security, there, it, it's an interesting space because it's not like, you know, you've got Microsoft or Oracle or a big a big person, uh, a big group that, you know, just dominates a particular industry. There's just so many smaller companies because security actually parallels the slope of the innovation curve. So as you have more innovation and you think about where we are today, Web 3.0 versus 1.0, I mean, it's pretty complicated, right? So you have to be specialists in a lot of areas to be able to protect those technologies. And that's why it's a pretty fragmented industry. That being said, when you go to the RSA show and you got five, 6,000 vendors, they're not all going to survive, right? So some of them are not going to survive. Some of them are features that will get bought. Others will, will turn into you know, bigger public companies. But that's a, it's a small number of, you think about how many security companies are out there and how many are really public, as an example. It's a pretty small number. So definitely consolidation will happen. And, um, the thing is, it's a lot easier to start a company today than it was like in 2011 when I started CrowdStrike. You have APIs you can plug into. You've got all these uh, frameworks that create your UI. You've got all these open source uh, graph technology. Like all this stuff didn't exist in 2011, and it makes it really easy. And that that low friction makes it then really, you know, you give me a lot of companies that fail faster. I think just because there's just a lot of competition in some of the areas. So consolidation. Any other uh, yeah. trends do you see in the cybersecurity in the future? I mean, I'm trying to think what is, I'm, I'm a big sci-fi fan. Mm. And I'm like thinking about e-commerce and then you see a movie and then the person walks and it scans their eyes and it gives them like the recommendation. What is like the sci-fi of cybersecurity? You know, I wish it was a real sci-fi, but look, uh, every time I, I, I've, I'm on a panel or something, we're still talking about crappy passwords, you know, 30 years <laughs> later, right? So. We still haven't solved that problem in, in many cases. I know there's some startups, I'm sure, in the audience that have solved it, but at scale, it hasn't been solved. And um, it's, it's, not, it's not as, uh, as sexy as you know, we would like. I mean, I think it's just grinding it out with um, helping companies make sure they're in compliance and, and protect themselves. And the bar is still, still pretty low. And I think that's where we see sometimes, even on a, in the startup world, they, somebody will come out with like the most innovative, coolest thing. And that's a maturity level five, and your average sort of enterprise is maturity level two, right? So how do you, how do you get somebody engaged when they have, they're not even doing the basics right? Okay. We'll wait and see what the future brings. Yeah. I want this something like the Darth Vader. -y. I don't have it. Ask, ask. Maybe it's the wrong industry. E-commerce. You think about e-commerce. That could be like a sci-fi thing. They have a lot of ideas. They got a lot of ideas. Yes. We're just, you know... We're just trying to keep the bad guys out. We're not that, <laughs> we're not that fancy. I, I got to say, in the morning, before yeah. we started, there was a technical difficulty. And um, my team sent me on stage to tell jokes. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell jokes. So I asked everyone, tell me a joke. And it turns out cybersecurity is a very serious subject. It is a very serious, <laughs> yes. This is, this, is not a, uh, this is not a lively crowd. No. But you know, I, I, I always say like cybersecurity is like being in middle school with people that have money. It's like, you know, it's kind of a weird industry of just how it works and, you know, everybody's fighting each other and there's just, it's just crazy. So um, it's no, a serious group out here. Well, I saw what two of my entrepreneurs showed up in those funny shirts in the morning and I them, says, what are you wearing? You look like two geeks in a, in a, in a, you know, in a, in a trade show. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's what we are. Yes. <laughs> so um, I want to ask uh, advice for startups. So yep. since there's so many startups and everything is so far granted and there's a long line outside of the CISO's door, what is your recommendation? What is the best way for a startup to succeed and get attention? Get attention. I think that the number one way to succeed is, you know, it isn't glitzy marketing. It isn't a whole bunch of like gimmicks. It really is providing value to the customer. And if you can, in whatever industry, if you can provide value and you get somebody to part with their hard earned money, and that, that's a big part of, as you know, venture investing is like somebody willing to part with their money for your product 
you know, that's what counts. And um, I used to work with a sales guy that on his, on his card, he basically said, have I provided value today? And he made it, he put it on every salesperson's card, like, have I provided value? And the whole idea was, if you're not thinking about solving a problem, getting an outcome, providing value, like, what are you doing? And I see too many folks that want to talk about, you know, the new features and the speeds and the feeds and, you know, look how cool the UI is. And then it's like, well, what, what are you solving? Like, how, how does it change my day? And I think you really have to go through that process because when people are buying your product, you know, there's a personal aspect to buying it, and then there's a company aspect. And the personal aspect is people want to succeed in their job, number one. They want to look good. And uh, they also want to provide ba value back to their organization. So if you can help someone do all of that and um, be successful, you're going to have more repeat customers. You're going to have people buy into it. And you see a lot of marketing campaigns that kind of come and go and a lot of splashes and all these parties that happened, you know, all over the place. I don't think we... It was a bit of a mistake, and I'll tell you why, but I don't think we went to sponsored RSA, or we didn't have a booth at RSA for like three years because we'd have all these private meetings. Um, and we just didn't need it, and we just wanted to save money, and we just met with customers to show them the value. Now, the downside of that is uh, we had crappy booth space for like five years after because we weren't in the queue to keep getting new booths. So don't make that mistake. Um, <laughs> But that, that literally is my, my number one thing, is provide value and listen to the customer and, um, and learn from them. And if you do that, I think you know, you'll be successful. I want to ask you about category creation versus joining an existing one. What do you think, I mean, what do you think is better? It's, it's hard to create a new category. It takes a lot of time and money um, to be able to do that. So but then it, you're the only one. You're the only one, but it's, you know, you can have fast followers that come in there. I mean, there's pros and cons. You know, there's a book called Play Bigger. If you haven't read it, it's wor worth reading. But it's really about category creation. And, um, it, like, if you look at what we did, we, we, there was a category and dissatisfaction with antivirus. So there was endpoint security, but there was no EDR. The term didn't even exist. So we kind of created that, and then Gardner gave it a name, and, you know, it worked. So it was you know, partly creation, but there was a need for it. If you just come up with something that's brand new, you can be, you know, like virtualization VMware. I mean, they, they pretty much they created it. And they killed it, um, but then you had all the other open source and all these other players that are out there. So it's possible, it's just really expensive. If you get it right and you hit a home run, like you're gonna crush everybody, but if you don't and you spend a bunch of money and then it's you know the fast followers who draft you, let you spend the money, and then boom, they just copy your message and they're in right behind you. So um, you know, pick your poison, and I'm sure many folks have, have experienced that. Not an easy thing, expensive, um, and it really depends on you know, your product and your industry. And um, I'll ask probably like two or three more questions, yeah. and then it, uh, I'm going to open it to you guys. Um, tell me about yourself as a leader. What kind of a leader? What's your leadership style? Leadership style. Uh, what you see is what you get. Um, you know, I, I, I might fit into the Israeli culture of uh, telling it like it is, and you know. Um, stand me in the front, not in the back. A, a, yes, you know where you stand. Trust me, you know where you stand. I, I think it's important to um, to make sure that you hire the right people and empower them and. You know, that's a bit of the hard part a bit as being a, a founder CEO because you want to be involved in everything, but you got to spend the time, hire the right people, empower them, and then hold people accountable. And, you know, big thing for me is always trying to do the right thing by the people and the customers. Um, commitment is a big deal. Like, what is your commitment to the business? What is your commitment to me? And it's either you... You're, commitment in terms of loyalty? No, no, I meant uh, loyalty is important, but I mean like, okay, is, is the product out on time? Does it work as advertised or are we, we still coming up with excuses, right? Uh, did we hit our numbers or did we not hit our numbers, right? I mean, a anybody can make excuses on anything else. At the end of the day, you got to be able to execute. You got to commit to the business because it's not just one, you know, you're building a product. It's not just the product, the marketing team, the sales team. Everybody's dependent on you, right? And vice versa. So you have to be, uh, you have to honor your commitments. You got to be transparent. And I think for me, I hate the politics. Like, I'm not a politics person. I just, it annoys me. It just gets in the way of getting anything done. And if we have a problem, I'd rather just say, hey, look, we have a problem. Like, how are we going to fix it? We don't need to go politic around it and blame other people. Let's get it fixed. And uh, that's, you know, that's always how I've operated. Like, people understand if what my word is and my commitment. And, y you know, you have to set the stage, too, in terms of work and harder than ever. Um, you know, I call Bird our CFO four in the morning. He can attest to it. Um, and, huh? Not every day. 
uh, many, many times. It depends. I don't really look at the time zone. I just start calling. You know, but, but I think at the end of the day, you, you know, if you have the right people and you empower them and you measure success and you win and lose as a team, that's what people care about. It's also fun. It's fun. You've got to have fun. I mean, you spend so much time doing this. Um, you know, my, my general philosophy is we're here to win. Like, you know, yes, there's a business. Yes, there's customers, everything else. But at the end of the day, if you're winning, you're successful. Your people are successful. Your customers are successful. And your shareholders are successful. And if you're not going to show up to win, then, you know, go, go do something else. What about mentors? Do you have a mentor? Someone to... Um, it's, it's, it's a good question. So one of our, our chairman is a um, great guy. He retired from McAfee. We got to McAfee to, to, together at the same time because he had sold the company. He was CEO. I was CEO. And we're like, okay, now we're two CEOs sitting at a big company. Uh, what are we doing? And um, we actually, uh, I think, made good progress there. We did a lot of good things. And then he retired. And so we spent a lot of time uh, thinking about you know, some of the challenges and, you know, what we're going to see as we scale. And I would say uh, somebody like that has been instrumental in just being able to bounce ideas off. And, you know, ten, 10 years ahead of me, you've seen, you know, different things that I haven't. And what are your biggest challenges today? And with that, I'll move it to the crowd. Yeah, b biggest challenge, I would say, uh, two areas. One is it's really hard to get the right people. Um, I think everybody knows it's a, it's a war for talent. You know, is it going to get any better maybe with, with, with a little bit of a macro headwind? Maybe. Um, but that's always a hard one because if you look at who we're recruiting, uh, it's the same talent pool that Google and Facebook and Amazon and everybody's, you know, AWS are all recruiting from the same talent pool, big data, latest and greatest technology. So that's one. The second one is um, in security, I, I tell you what, I, I would hate to be a customer. I hate to be an analyst. I hate to be you know, a sell side analyst and industry analyst, et cetera, because it all sounds the same. Literally everybody just copies everything that's out there. They'll take whatever you put out and, you know, paint it a different color and copy and say they have that too. And then it becomes a knife fight every day of like, okay, well, let me show you why it's different. And it just adds to the sales cycle and confusion in the marketplace. So I think those are two of the big challenges of just being able to cut through the noise that's out there, security super noisy, and then just making sure that you always have the best people on your team. Well, learning from your advice before, you just got to show that you create value. Got to create value. You got to create, you gotta create value. value. Yeah. So with that, I'm um, opening the stage uh, for you. Noah is over there with a speaker. Just um, introduce yourself and ask your question. Now raise your hand if you have one so she can this see one, you. This one in the back. Yeah. Um, guy, I can't see. Yeah, it's guy. Speak up. Okay, I'm Guy. I'm, I'm Stand up, Guy. No. Yes. Okay. Stand up. Um, Mike? We hear you, but okay. no, it comes with them. So about uh, 10 days ago, I saw a headline saying uh, uh, CrowdStrike CEO playing catch up in Israel looking for deals. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know you guys have been kind of built over by for the longest time. I know you've done a few acquisitions, but there was that big rumor about that $2 billion acquisition. Not asking you to comment about rumors, but have you changed mindset or DNA? Are you kind of bored? buy versus build now, and specifically about Israel? Anything well, I'd be happy to comment because it was a garbage article. So <laughs> as you said, rumors. Um, and the biggest thing, we haven't changed our mindset. We like to buy teams. We like to buy technologies. A lot of our acquisitions have been small and digestible. And we haven't changed our philosophy on that at all. So um, I was in Israel. You know, we have a Falcon Fund. We met with a lot of companies. We made, already made some investments. Some of our investments are, you know, uh, companies are here. And, uh, you know, we're always looking for innovation and, and being part of the ecosystem early on and making it part of our platform. So that's, the, that's why I continue to go. And we have a big office there. We bought a company called Preempt a couple of years ago. How do you decide if you want to buy a company or just uh, partner with it? Um, you know, does it, it's, it's a classic build by, you know, partner. Does it fit a need for us? Do we like the space? Um, you know, the price tag has to be the right price tag. And biggest thing for me is a cultural fit. There are a lot of companies out there that have great technology, but it won't be a cultural fit. And a lot of times, um, and, I, and I learned this from when I was at McAfee, bought 21 companies. I can tell you not all of them went well. Um, you know, a lot of the acquisitions won't go well, so you really have to be cautious about what you buy, and you have to make sure that, the people and the company will be successful within CrowdStrike. Do you have a question? 
No. Yeah, uh, Dico, uh, part of a uh, co-founder of an early stage startup. My question to you is kind of a two-fold question. Uh, for many startups that early stage, there's a point where kind of that the, the sales kind of starts hockey stick. Mm -hmm. As you realize that you capture something that yep. really does that. So first question, what was it for you that actually was that kind of initial, we got it. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, uh, how did you go through the process of figuring out what is that main thing that kind of catapulted you? I would say the hockey stick was when we were able to fully replace um, McAfee and Symantec. And, you know, when you listen to the, the customer panel that was up here, they don't want to buy another anything unless they can replace something else for the most part. Like, you know, new stuff, generally it's kind of one in, one out, or one in and three out. That's where you find a lot of value. So we ran side by side with McAfee, Symantec, et cetera, for a while because it just it had a... You know, we didn't want to go in in uh, five guys, a dog in a garage, and say, hey, we're just going to replace McAfee. Like, that's not going to, in a large enterprise. You know, Phil was up here, Phil Venables. He was early customer. You're not going to go in and talk to Phil and, and go, hey, take all that stuff out for, you know, a person, a hundred person company, Goldman Sachs. So you got to run side by side. We did. And then once people realized they could replace things, then it was like, boom, hockey stick. And I think what's important there is, again, kind of a lesson learned is people focus a lot on their law. Why, why did we lose? That is fine. You have to focus as much or more on why did you win, right? So once you figure out the formula why you won, then you got to do more of that. And um, you know, we figured out why we won. We figured out our niche, and then it was you know off to the races when we could replace you know the other technologies that were in the environment. Okay. Next one. More questions. Well, I'm going to ask one then. Okay. I've had a long question. Yeah, all right. So I read that you raised the seed round of $25 million. Mm -hmm. That was a while ago. Yeah. That's a lot of money. How did you convince, you know, why $25 million? It was more than $20. <laughs> um, okay, so why $25 million? Uh, I well, guess did, the, the, joke, the joke goes I wrote 25 slides, I got $25 million, so it was a million bucks a slide. I should have wrote 30 slides. Um, but th it was really non traditional because we did our A round with Warburg Pincus and that is not your, you know. It's not a VC. That's not Excel or Sequoia or something like that, right? Or whoever. Um, it's not your 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 early stage sort of uh, group that you would go to. But they wanted to buy. Well, they wanted to put money into my first company, Foundstone, as I was selling it to McAfee. They wanted to build a platform out. We're in the middle of selling it, and it just didn't work out. So they said, "Hey, whenever you want to do another deal, just let us know." And every year they would call me, like clockwork. Hey, you want to do another deal? Till finally, I said, "Yeah, I got this idea," and we chatted with them. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll back you on this. And we took a lot of money because it was, we wanted to be well capitalized. And at 25 now, I mean, now the rounds are a lot bigger, 100 million sometimes seed rounds. But um, a big part of it was we wanted to make sure we had enough money for people to come over and, and basically weather the storm and, and be able to build it. I had to convince people from Microsoft and Apple and Google and others to join. And I wasn't going to convince them with like $2 million. Like, they had to know that there was a path that we were going to run out of money. And it was a big company. I think, yeah, when you spoke before about the corporate person, the CISO that, that is buying, that you want to look good and you want to prove value, but you also you don't want to take a risk that's not necessary. I mean, I'm imagining if I were a CISO and I had a startup that's not funded mm -hmm. or not well-funded in front of me versus a big corporate, maybe the startup has a better product, but I don't know what's going to happen with them. It's 100% it's true. Like, are they going to be around or are they going to be acquired? And I can't tell you how many times, we have to do it less today because we just point people to the public filings, but you know, you're going to sell them to a big bank. It's like they want the balance sheet, they want the CFO to sign off on it, they want to know how much cash you have. I mean, it, it's really extensive. It's know your customer like times 10. And if you don't have you know, a big or multiple big brand names behind you on the venture side, if you didn't raise a whole bunch of money, you're going to be at a deficit to some of the others that are out there. Uh, another, uh, unless you guys have, yeah, have a question, go ahead. Hey George, um, you, uh, you mentioned, and obviously... Can you just introduce yourself? Uh, um, so you sold Foundstone to McAfee right, yep. uh, when, when we were there. Yep. Uh, and then you talked about acquiring a lot of companies while you are at McAfee. Mm -hmm. And you talked about not acquiring as many companies here. Is that experience as a founder, was that instructive to you in how you're running CrowdStrike and not being as acquisitive? Um, and then how did you also think about, because I know you had a lot of opportunities to sell CrowdStrike throughout the years. Mm -hmm. How did you make that decision to 
continue to go forward at different times? Yeah, um, good question. So for me, I had a, you know, I had McAfee, we were there. Um, I had a great run, it was, you know, great experience. Um, but I learned as much as what to do as what, as what not to do. Like, and I was just like, I don't think we should do it that way. And, you know, we just, I want to do things differently. So part of it was if you're going to make acquisitions, you've got to make them work. And you can't, you can't fumble doing that. So for me, it's like we spent a lot of time before we, we acquire a company. And, and again, it's got to have the right fit. It's got to, all the, there's so many boxes that have to be checked and it's a high bar. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect on it, but I don't want to make mistakes of just buying a bunch of stuff and, and swizzling it together. Now, how that manifested itself was, and you remember, we bought a bunch of companies and we had like 10 agents. That didn't, that didn't go so well because we had to go to every customer and say, oh yeah, we got another agent. They don't want that. So that was informative of how I think about acquisitions. That's the uh, first part of your question. Second part is really on acquiring the company uh, or selling the company. You know, for us, Foundstone we sold and it was the right thing, you know, given our market and, and where we were. And with CrowdStrike, it was such a big TAM, such a big platform. Nobody was doing it. You know, it wasn't a product play. It was a platform play. And I thought that could be a public company and, you know, I thought it could be pretty big. So uh, for me, I would just, you know, kept my head down and, you know, we kept cranking and until we got to a level where everybody's like, okay, you know, I think this should be a public company. And then we went out. You know, we're lucky, you know, the timing was good in 2019. And, um, you know, it's been a fun run ever since. Okay. Got a question over there? Yeah, raise your hands if you have questions and so now I can come with the speaker and seize you. Hey, uh, you're from Centra. Um, so CISOs and customers love, like, the concept of managed detection and response, which combines technology and, and human expertise, mm -hmm. and sets them on work, makes them efficient. Yeah, Do you think that... Oh, okay, like so uh, I'll skip the first part. Do you think that there are other areas in cybersecurity, because like so many of us try to solve different problems, that like a managed service could also be a good fit, other than what CrowdStrike does? Yeah, I was actually chatting with um, a gentleman earlier about this. Uh, so we, we came out with um, MDR, Managed Detection Response, and it wasn't called MDR. Like we really came out, again, another thing we pioneered, we called it Overwatch. And it didn't have a name until Gartner, I guess, came out with a name. But we came out with it because um, customers, A, they, EDR was newer to them. They didn't really understand all of everything, how it all worked. We tried to make it as easy as, as we could. But also, uh, the benefit of, of CrowdStrike was the crowd in the, in, the, in the CrowdStrike, right? We got 176 different countries that we operate in agent-wise, not, not selling. And we're seeing everything. And that big part of my, my goal was, and this is why it's called Falcon, because you can... You know, you have this bird's eye view of everything that's happening. Is we learn from all the customers, so there aren't many attacks that we really haven't seen. Like the implementation could be different, but the attack type is pretty similar, and um, that's usually valuable for customers. So you get a better outcome with less people, and um, you're learning from the entire community. It's community immunity. So I do think that there are other technologies in this audience that would benefit from that sort of very focused service, but what we didn't do is we didn't manage anybody else's stuff. We don't really care about that. It's, we are the, as a manufacturer, we are the best to manage our own stuff, and we know more about it in terms of all these attacks because we see it all across seven trillion events per week. So answer, long and short is probably a good opportunity for people in here to do that. Thank you. You have a question too, next to him? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, Gal from Oligo Security. I wanted to ask if uh, along the way, now from your point of view, how significant was is like choosing the right investors? Like, did it like had any part in the success of cards? Like, or like, was just, I don't know. Yeah, I have to, if I have a, a podium here, I have to get on it because um, this is like a hot button for me. Um, my first company, I thought we sold too early. And, uh, you know, it was first time uh, CEO and, and we didn't, we had okay investors. They were not tier A, shall we say. And it worked out. I mean, it got me to Mac. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not complaining about it. But what happened was we raised money in 1999. And guess what happened in 2000? We don't. Right? We remember that. Some of you probably remember that. Um, some of you maybe don't. <laughs> Wasn't as easy money as it is today. And uh, so we had this nuclear winter of 2001, and then come 2004, we were basically the only thing worth a, a darn in a lot of these funds. 
And you know, you know how it works. People, they got to close out the fund. They got to raise another fund. Who's, who wanted to buy a new house? Whose kids were going to college? Like, I didn't care about any of that, but that's what I had to deal with. And for the next go around, I said, There's, I'm not getting in bed with anyone who doesn't have a long-term view of taking the company public and has a ton of money. And by the way, doesn't need CrowdStrike to raise another fund. You know, you look at you know a Warburg or an Excel or Google or whoever's in our. You know, we have a lot of big names in there, right? They don't. They didn't. Yeah, we made them a lot of money, but they didn't need CrowdStrike to raise another fund. Another Thank question. you. Yes, over there. Hi, I'm Seiyo from Pakinka, and I'm wondering, U.S. is a like big market, but there's other countries in the world. Where do you see like the next good opportunity in the market or the country? Of um, well, I continue to believe uh, Japan is a great market, as you know. Uh, it's, it's actually like, you know, the, the stats on it uh, for endpoints is the second biggest market. So I, I think, you know, from our perspective, and most companies that start in, in North America, you, you can have a bias here, all the big companies are here. Um, and we're like 70-30-ish in terms of, you know, revenue from North America versus the rest of the world. We want to get that to 50-50. And I think, you know, APAC region's great. Um, obviously, uh, Europe has got some headwinds, um, but still have a lot of compliance and security needs. So it, it's hard to say any one particular area. I mean, there's a lot of countries that we don't sell in. Like, we made decisions not to sell in early on into China or Russia. That just are, we just, A, we weren't going to make a bunch of money there because they're incumbents, and two, we didn't want to do it. So I think what's important for us is to figure out where we think there's a market, who will buy our product, and focus our efforts there. And where I see people kind of going sideways, if they try to do a little here and there, it's like, oh, we'll put a salesperson and we'll put an SE in a country and hope it goes well. It never goes well. Like, if you're going to go into a country, load it up with 20 people or 30 people and go into it. Don't do it, like, half-assed. So... Um, you know, that, that's the way I look at it. But again, anybody can buy our technology, you know, around the world. We just need to have a good presence there to, to sell it and service it locally. More questions? Yes, please. Hello? Yeah. Young Se Song from uh, Grip Security. And I was just curious, as you're scaling the company, um, there are certain things that are measurable, going back to your keeping score comment about the racing. So things like bookings and things like that are very easily measurable. But how about all the things that you need to do to help you achieve those targets? How do you measure or make sure that you're actually making progress towards your goal um, as you're building this company and, and scaling and hiring and, and all of those things? Well, it's, it's a really important question. You have to look at what activities lead to success. So on the sales side, you know, how many touch points? How many calls you make in a day? How many appointments did you set? How many demos did you give? You know, all of that matters, right? And, and we've instrumented it down pretty well because if you don't see that level of activity, like you're just gonna show up and hope for the best. So everything needs to be measured and managed. And I'm not, believe we are not perfect in every area. I don't, I don't mean to, to, to come off and say that we are. We always can do better. But unless you really look at the activity, the inputs that go into something, you're never going to get the outcome. And I think people just kind of hope, it, you know, hey, we're going to go hire a salesperson and, you know, they came from some big company and it's going to take care of itself. And it doesn't because you just have to do the blocking and tackling and measure it. And literally, I mean, the biggest area that we, we try to measure is on the sales side because, um, you know, the, the more touches you have, somehow the luckier you get, right? It's kind of like, wow, you know, you got lucky because you made 10 extra phone calls that day. And uh, we do that across the business. You know, on the engineering side, you know, we're always kind of me measuring, you know, what we're coming out with, when are we coming out with, and just trying to course correct. Because if you wait to the end, you can't really fix things. Um, so having good metrics and visibility, we started that really early. We we're mostly a SaaS-based company. So we were able to pull everything out of all these different systems. Uh, we use Domo like to create all these cards and just try to hold people accountable. But it is the hardest thing to, to do in a company, I think, is create good metrics and uh, continue to hold people accountable, particularly as you scale. Go ahead. Hey, uh, this is PK. I run security in the company, but two factions. Uh, happy to have a great customer. Thank you. <laughs> so one piece that kind of our potential is you mentioned some of your future thinking is around 
data security and aspects of that, I really truly feel like there's a unique advantage for somebody like CrowdStrike who has such great endpoint coverage uh, across you know, the organization. So uh, to whatever extent that you can share, can you share some of the thinking behind it? What are you thinking about? Like a DLP kind of a play, CASB, or like what, some thinking around it, yeah. Thank you. Well, sure. And I think um, DLP by itself, just the name is broken. Data loss prevention I think is pretty archaic. I think it's very similar to a legacy AV product. Again, you talk to a lot of customers, they don't like the DLP they have. It's, you know, they got 10 people managing it, a bunch of false positive, a bunch of regex rules, et cetera. And we acquired a company called Secure Circle, which actually creates circles of trust, which is more like if you're in a circle of trust, you can, you can view data, you can, you, know, you can track data movements. And if you leave the circle of trust, all that data is useless. So whether you're getting the data from a SaaS service or from GitHub or whatever, it doesn't really matter. If you're in the circle, it works. And if you're out, it doesn't. And it, puts, it doesn't put the onus back on users to kind of go, well, is it confidential? Is it secret or whatever it is? And it's just a different way of thinking about you know, data tracking and movement and, 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 and data protection. So you know, we're still in the process of integrating that, but that's one of the things that we did. And I know there's a bunch of uh, companies in the audience working on some of that and different aspects. And um, I think there's some really innovative solutions. Like ours won't be the only solution, but I think it'll be a big part given our, our agent footprint. We have time for one last question. Guy. Okay. I'm Guy from uh, SafeBridge. Uh, if Red Bull would come and offer you to put your logo on their cars, are you going to move? Stay with Mercedes. Uh, you couldn't pay me to put my logo on the Red Bull car. So uh, we're Mercedes through and through. It's a great organization. And uh, we get along well with the people. And I think more importantly, um, there's an alignment of philosophy of um, you know, how we treat customers and how, and how we think about you know, being a winning team. So I've enjoyed our time there. And uh, we've had some great runs. This year's a little bit more challenging. But um, you know, winners learn from uh, you know, the losses. And I think uh, you've already seen some of the progress that's being made. So, Is Mercedes a customer? Of course they're a customer. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's how we actually got the, how we got into Mercedes is the F1 team came to us and said, our Microsoft stuff is not working and uh, we want something better. It's a true story. And they became a customer and then Daimler became a, a customer. So Amazing. I got it. Okay, I have one last one. So I was reading your Wikipedia page and it starts like fourth grade. He was uh, playing with the Commodore and then, yeah, like I know the rest of the story and then he became an engineer. And then it says, and then he became a CPA. Studied accounting. Why accounting, and how does that, you know, and do you use it today? Uh, yeah, so that's, that is a very good question. I don't think you'd bring that one up, but. Um, so. <laughs> I studied accounting, so I feel for you. Yeah, I know. So I, I, was always, I was always a computer kid. I did all kinds of programming and stuff and, and used to do, like, hardware hacking, all, all kinds of things. And um, so I did that, but when, when I went to college, a lot of it was, unless you went to MIT or something along those lines, or Stanford, which they invite me there all the time now, but I, I never got it. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Um, so when I was going to school, a lot of it was mainframe programming. And I didn't really want to be a mainframe program. That was just kind of boring to me. So I wanted to get a business degree. I was always, always had the entrepreneurial bug. So I got an accounting degree figuring, OK, if I understand the basic building blocks of, of, of business, then that will serve me. And it has, um, as my CFO knows, he gives me a hug every time because when he's I ha laughing. he's laughing because when when he'll tell the story when you know you know him uh, when we had it, I, I told him I will never have a perpetual uh, license in the history of CrowdStrike because uh, in the past when you have these mixed models like you know it's a disaster so all of that like really helped me think about how to build CrowdStrike how to think about recurring revenue how to think about um, you know, optimizing our business. And it was a great foundation. And I, I originally started, how I got into security, I started work at Price Waterhouse, got totally bored of uh, accounting, got into their consulting group, with a, was the fifth person in their consulting group uh, for security. And I didn't know where it would go. And you know, here we are today. So uh, it was great training. Um, and uh, you know, just sometimes you, you never know where you're going to land based upon the, the education that you actually have. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. It was amazing. Yeah, thanks. It was great to be here. All right. Thank you. We're going to get. Thank you so